5 o'clock is usually the time when TIF are shut down and everyone heads out. Normally, that's the time I wake up and uh, sort of get going to do things outside of my day job, like thinking about research or music or watching Roger Federer play or you know, any of the various hobbies. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to first uh, thank TIFR for inviting me and uh, I'll start off on a personal note and uh, then move over to what I want to talk about today. I'll try and keep it simple. I'm not sure if I have succeeded fully, uh, but uh, if I haven't, you can invite me again and uh, I'll, I'll try and do it right next time. So, uh, when I travel from my residence in Villapala West to the Reserve Bank of India Central Office in Ford, uh, I pass each way Kenilworth, uh, the birthplace of late uh, Homi Jahangir Baba. It's near Kem's Corner as you pass just local hospital. Uh, it is a good way to start and end the day, being reminded not just of his immense intellect, but also of his deep sense of service to India. I'm thus grateful to Professor uh, Deepan Ghosh, who was the Dean of Students uh, during my time at IIT Bombay, and Professor Trivedi uh, for inviting me to speak today in uh, Homi Baba Auditorium. I consider it as my good fortune to be able to do this. standard 
slides uh, in the form of my talk by raising an issue that I believe is germane to all of us in today's forum and that is worthy of being tackled in our economy in due course. Uh, and this issue is that of monetary transmission in India. Uh, why is it important and why hasn't it worked well? So let me start with some technical jargon that you often will read in the financial newspapers and then try to explain from first principles uh, the part of all this jargon that I wish to focus on. So here's the jargon. With the amendment of the Reserve Bank of India Act in 2016, the primary objective of the monetary policy is to maintain price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth. The Monetary Policy Committee or the MPC constituted under the amended RBI Act is mandated to determine the policy repo rate to achieve the specified medium term inflation target of 4% within a band of plus minus 2%. For the Reserve Bank to achieve its mandate effectively, it is extremely important that an economic process referred to as monetary transmission works seamlessly. Any impediment to this process of monetary transmission hampers the achievement of the Reserve Bank's mandate. We therefore monitor and analyze monetary transmission on a regular basis and undertake corrective steps to enhance its efficacy if the process seems broken or critically imperfect. So let me now turn to try and explaining all this or at least some parts of it in simple terms. So what is monetary transmission? It is essentially the process through which the policy actions of the central bank are transmitted to the ultimate objectives of stable inflation and growth. Policy action consists typically of changing the interest rate at which the central bank borrows or lends reserves, meaning literally the rupees that uh, you and I are used to, uh, on an overnight basis with commercial banks. In other words, monetary transmission is the entire process starting from the change in the policy 
currency rate by the central bank. So this is the rate at which it borrows and lends rupees with uh, commercial banks. It's the transmission from that rate to various money market rates such as interbank lending rates, so the rates at which banks lend to each other, to bank deposit rates, so these are the rates at which you invest your savings uh, into your uh, corner of the street banks. Bank lending rates, so these are the rates at which banks make mortgages or lend to firms in the economy, to government and corporate bond deals at which government and uh, corporations borrow directly from investors uh, and to asset prices such as stock prices and house prices uh, which we all love to track uh, when we wake up in the morning. Uh, I have not yet switched to Facebook and watching the morning posts of of my friends. So I still look at what's happening to the stock market and the exchange rate. Uh, this entire process of the of the way the policy rate that the central bank sets for doing its overnight operations, how it travels to all these different rates and prices is what is called as uh, monetary transmission. The transmission mechanism hinges crucially on how the policy changes influence households firms and banks behavior. Uh, the change in this behavior can take place through several channels. Uh, studying these channels is a vast subject in the finance and economics literature. In fact, if I had to use one word to describe most of my research, I would say it would be how is monetary policy affected when banks in an economy are not in good health. Uh, that sort of been the gist of most I have studied in my uh, 20 odd years of research. So, given that this is such a vast subject, in the interest of time, I'll only cover a few key aspects. Uh, I'll then explain how and why monetary transmission has, and more importantly, has not always worked in India and touch briefly upon how we could improve it. So let me describe the various channels of monetary transmission. Changes in the central bank's policy rate impact the policy uh, uh, impact the economy with lags through a 
variety of channels. Uh, the primary ones that are currently being studied are four. The interest rate channel, the credit channel or the bank lending channel, uh, the exchange rate channel and asset price channel. So I'll describe each of these in, uh, in some detail. So let us start with how the interest rate channel works. The most immediate impact of a change in the monetary policy rate is on the short term money market rates. So short term money market rates are rates such as call money rates. So that is when uh, banks borrow from each other without necessarily providing any security or collateral. Certificates of deposit rates, uh, these are rates at which uh, banks try to borrow uh, at uh, fixed maturities from savers such as you and me. Uh, commercial papers, which is a version of short-term paper that corporations access in the market, typically 90 days maturity in order to manage their working capital needs. You know, they have to pay employees, they have to pay their suppliers, etc. And treasury bills, which is what the government issues at short maturities for its own working capital needs. The government also has to pay its bills, uh, pay its employees, uh, and meet uh, some immediate cash flow needs on various projects that it may be undertaking. There is also an immediate impact on key financial markets such as exchange rates and equity prices and also on medium term and long term instruments uh, that I mentioned earlier such as government bonds and corporate bonds which are typically issued at maturities longer. Now this uh, impact is usually quite quick uh, and broadly one to one from the policy rate to short term money market rates such as the call money rate uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in fact, it is so quick that when we release our policy resolution at 2.30 p.m., it becomes public. If there is a significant policy change, it is usually the most perceptible sharp jump in the interest rates, the short term interest rates in the economy in, in the short segment, as I've mentioned. So why is it that the policy rate transmits very quickly to the, the call money rate, which is the rate at which banks borrow from each other in 
the overnight market on an unsecured or uncollateralized basis. So the reasoning is really straightforward. A bank will be willing to part with the reserves of the rupees that it has overnight to another bank only if it earns at least the rate that it could earn by parking these funds with the central bank. So what the central bank is trying to do with its policy rate is basically announce what is the rate at which I as the central bank am willing to do transactions with the banks. Now another bank therefore will lend to yet another bank in the economy only if the return that it is going to get by lending overnight exceeds the return it can earn directly from just parking the funds with the central bank. Now, if there are enough banks competing in the market for such lending to the bank that needs the reserves uh, that night, it could be for a very simple reason why might a bank need reserves that night? Maybe because unexpectedly a large number of its depositors took money out of the, of the ATMs. Then it would be short of reserves to meet its various payments. But that's just a temporary need. These savers will bring back some other deposits tomorrow. So it can just smooth its reserves need overnight by going to another bank where perhaps as many depositors did not withdraw and they can just help each other smooth their liquidity needs. So if enough banks compete for lending reserves to the bank that needs the reserves, then the rate will in fact closely track the central bank's policy rate because the best they can get is to go to the central bank. If they try to charge too much above that, someone else will actually lend and then in equilibrium the rates will come down. The impact of the policy rate on other market rates is not so direct. It varies based on the tenor or the maturity of the instrument. It also depends on liquidity conditions and other factors such as how much extra compensation is demanded by a lender for parking their funds beyond overnight because then in that time the central bank could change its rates again and now they want to be compensated for the risk that they are taking uh, in the process. But given that the transmission is quite immediate, quick and reasonably good to the rate at which banks lend to 
each other. consumer due 
wearables such as automobiles uh, and for housing and from entrepreneurs uh, for new or increased investment in their plant and machinery an increased demand for vehicles housing and machinery in turn generates increased demand for the inputs including labor uh, in these industries uh, if more vehicles are being demanded uh, the vehicle manufacturers have to expand their capacity so they will have to increase labor in these industries uh, and this way you get an overall increase in demand incomes and output in the economy uh, so put in a nutshell this is a, this is how a central bank hopes that its policy rate cuts through one channel which is simply the interest rate channel uh, could actually boost uh, the outcomes for the economy now as this process continues uh, the increased demand eventually puts upward pressure on wages of labor and prices of inputs uh, and this way policy rate cuts eventually start raising inflation in the economy because there is greater demand for labor there is greater demand for raw materials inputs and so on so you can see why a central bank that is mandated to maintain stable prices uh, such as the reserve bank of india while taking account of growth faces a delicate trade off when it's lowering or raising its policy rates the, the implicit assumption that i made in all of this is that bank balance sheets are strong and in a position to step up quickly the supply of credit in response to the lower funding cost and higher demand for credit uh, this aspect of banks being ready to expand their balance sheets when policy rates are cut wanting to capture a bigger share of the uh, loan demand is called as the bank lending or the credit or the credit channel of the monetary transmission that's the second uh, channel a cross country evidence indicates that monetary transmission is greatly hindered if bank balance sheets are weak in that they do not have much loss absorption capacity to deal squarely with their legacy problem loans uh, indeed uh, evidence that uh, many researchers uh, and have contributed uh, quite a bit to this literature myself uh, suggests that there might be evergreening of bad loans uh, of what is called as zombie lending uh, lending to distressed firms 
comes at subsidized rates to kick the can of the loan defaults down the road. Uh, so you know the loan is bad, but you just roll it over in the hope that you never have to declare that it's a bad loan uh, because that might require uh, taking a write down on your buffers, you might violate the central bank's prudential norms about your safety, and that could lead to uh, some corrective actions. Um, uh, indeed, what happens when uh, central banks have attempted to stimulate growth with aggressive policy rate cuts when there are bank balance sheet problems uh, is that very often these policy rate cuts get wasted. The stimulus that I was describing earlier doesn't happen because banks are actually not in a position to compete for increasing loans in the economy. They are actually more worried about the problems that are haunting them from their past legacy loans. Uh, it usually ends up in misallocation of resources, productivity losses, and weak growth. Uh, what the Austrian economists have called malinvestments, uh, and it uh, the rate cuts, however, create false hopes of growth. Uh, and in fact, relax the pedal on deeper balance sheet and structural reforms of the banking sector. The effectiveness of this bank credit channel is a critical issue in the current juncture in India, to which I'll come back a bit later. Let me now talk about the third and the fourth channel very briefly. Uh, lower interest rates also boost asset prices such as housing and equity prices. Uh, take housing for example with lower interest rates and lower mortgages if the credit channel is working well, uh, then because houses can be purchased cheaper, there will be a greater competition for buying houses uh, on part of the uh, savers in the economy, uh, and that will actually cause the housing prices to rise uh, because you know housing inventory is not going to adjust uh, on uh, on an instantaneous basis to the renewed demand in the economy so the resulting boost to household or more generally even corporate wealth and improved Cash flows on the back of lower interest rates because you are getting your same capacity to consume or invest, but now you have a lower interest rate cost to pay. These also add to the demand impulses in the economy. And this is called as the 
asset price channel of monetary transmission. Uh, in fact, these things can create a sort of a virtuous cycle. Higher asset prices can enhance the value of the collateral or net worth of the household. So, if housing prices are rising, banks would be more willing to lend to the households. Uh, now, this in turn can again actually boost uh, the bank lending or the credit channel I was just describing earlier. Finally, lower domestic interest rates could lead to a depreciation of the domestic currency because even bringing their dollars into the country, converting it into rupees is going to earn a lower rate. Uh, on the one hand, this will, this depreciation will make exports more competitive in the global market. And because there are more exports, the export segment of your corporates uh, will add to domestic demand and economic activity. But you can see that this doesn't necessarily have to go one way. Uh, it could because uh, a depreciated current will also have a direct upward impact on the domestic currency prices of imported imports. In our case, uh, the most important one being crude oil. Uh, as you might have been reading, uh, it has appreciated in prices uh, substantially over the last Uh, in any way, whichever way this plays out, this is called as the exchange rate uh, channel of monetary transmission. All, the, all these channels that I have described, the interest rate channel, the bank lending or credit channel, the asset price channel and the exchange rate channel, they are not standalone channels. Uh, they all are working together in the economy. Sometimes they reinforce and interact with each other so that their individual impact is quite often difficult uh, to disentangle and therefore this vast body of, of finance and economics work that is trying to ferret out how these channels are getting transmitted in the economy. It also needs to be recognized that uh, this mechanism is rather complex. I have tried to simplify it as much as I could. Uh, the speed and strength at which the central bank's policy rate changes travel to the rest of the economy also varies widely from country to country depending on the structure of the economy and the state of the financial system. Uh, in fact, a very important topic on monetary policy, uh, including in India, is the lags at which central banks' 
policy rate cuts actually get transmitted to the rest of, of the economy. So all these processes that I described uh, that banks have to compete for making loans, they have to ensure that there is enough buffers in their balance sheets to make these loans. Uh, the fact that asset prices or housing prices may rise and in turn create another round of loans because households net worth is perceived to be greater if house prices are rising. Uh, all of these things don't happen instantaneously or overnight like the immediate impact that gets transmitted to the short term rates uh, in the economy. So the available uh, data evidence for India suggests that monetary policy actions of the Reserve Bank they are felt by the real economy with a lag of two to three quarters on output and with a lag of three to four quarters on inflation, the building up of uh, prices. Uh, and the impact usually persists for much longer, about two to three years, eight to twelve quarters. Among the channels of transmission for India, the interest rate channel, the first channel that I described in some detail, has been found to be the strongest. The fact that central bank changing the rates on overnight funding, it produces an immediate impact on the rates at which banks exchange liquidity. Through that, it alters deposit rates, loan rates, and so on. Given that monetary policy impacts output and inflation with these kinds of long and often variable lags, sometimes it may be two quarters, sometimes four quarters, depending upon the health of the banking system, typically the latent demand for growth in the economy. Uh, it is critical for monetary policy actions to be forward looking, uh, that monetary policy needs to respond to expected output and inflation developments rather than just what has happened in the last few quarters. Now, of course, expected evolution of output and inflation is uncertain, uh, thereby rendering the transmission analysis even more challenging, uh, adding to the complexity of of the central bank's decision making, uh, and if I may say so, creating exciting opportunities for our critiques uh, in media and elsewhere. Uh, but the key point that I want to drive home from all this is that if parts of this transmission machinery are broken, then monetary policy 
policy would be less effective and sometimes the analogy I used to give to my students uh, at NYU was of um, uh, how the gas pumps in Manhattan uh, used to work. Uh, I had never actually asked the question how fuel reaches the gas pumps uh, in uh, the gas stations uh, in the city of New York until uh, Hurricane Sandy actually hit the shores of New Jersey. Uh, rather hard uh, and, and suddenly one of the collateral damage from that was that there was no gas being filled up in the st uh, gas stations in New York City. And so this monetary transmission is a little bit like the assumed plumbing of the economy that's supposed to work seamlessly. Central bank cuts rates, beautiful things should happen to the economy until it gets too good, inflation picks up and then you rotate the dial back a little bit uh, and so on. And it's only when it fails that you actually start asking the question, what's really going on? Where are these, why isn't the gas traveling from the shores of New Jersey? to the gas stations in New York, allowing vehicles to go, allowing children to go to their schools, people to go to their workstations, and so on. Um, so let me therefore talk about the performance of this transmission from policy rate to bank lending rates in India. Uh, there is a reason why I am talking about it today because we think that we need to improve uh, this performance. So um, let me describe it. Let me give you a little bit of history. Uh, talk about uh, how it has uh, behaved, what may be the factors as to why it may not have worked as well as uh, one might have wanted it to be. Uh, the Indian financial system remains bank dominated. Though the share of non bank finance companies and market funding through corporate bonds, commercial paper, stocks, etc., in the overall financing of the economy is also rising steadily. But I think at this point, it's fair to say that the overall efficacy of monetary transmission in India hinges critically on the extent and the pace with which banks are taking a cue from and induced by the changes in the reserve banks policy report rate, adjust their deposit and lending rates uh, and then compete to meet adequately 
with the economy's demand for credit. Um, overall, the data that we have analyzed seems to suggest that the pass through from policy rate changes to bank lending rates has been rather slow and in fact muted. Uh, this lack of adequate monetary transmission remains a key policy concern for us uh, as the central bank because it blunts the impact of its policy changes on economic activity and inflation. So, you know, if the transmission Transmission is not working at all. So, if I, if the central bank, the or the monetary policy committee uh, cuts or raises interest rates, and nothing happens to the economy, then I, uh, then you know the only reason for us to move the dial would be to use it as a fidget toy, you know, so that we don't do any other damage <laughs> during the rest of the day. Let's just turn the dial a little bit. So this is, this is literally what I tell my mother-in-law when she asks me, why do you need to change interest rates every two months? And I tell her, listen, on a light note, I do it because it's my fidget toy. But of course, uh, what's supposed to work is that uh, all this monetary transmission is supposed to take place. Uh, in the manner that I just described, and if it takes place, it's really, really a powerful fidget toy. It's actually going to completely alter the demand and growth and the prices, etc., as I described in the economy. Okay. So let me come to uh, sharing a little bit of the Indian experience on the performance of this monetary transmission. Since the deregulation of interest rates in the early 1990s, so leaving the rates uh, to markets, to financial institutions, to banks. Uh, the Reserve Bank has made several attempts to improve the speed and extent of the monetary pass through by refining the process of setting the lending interest rates by banks. While at the same time imparting transparency about this rate setting process for borrowers and giving flexibility to banks in the process of their interest rate setting. Uh, in fact, we have transited across several systems from the prime lending rate or PLR system in 1994 to the benchmark prime lending rate or BPLR system in 2003 to the base rate system in 2010 to the present marginal cost of funds based lending rate or MP 
CLR system in 2016. Let me explain these interest rate setting regimes briefly before I turn to an assessment of the more recent regimes which are the base rate which is the immediate legacy regime and the prevalent MCLR uh, rate setting system. So in India as in a number of other countries, a large proportion of loans is at floating rates. That is the interest rate that is charged to the borrower. So if I am the borrower that has taken a mortgage from uh, my corner of the street bank, my interest rate keeps changing year to year. Uh, that's the current typical reset periodicity of these interest rates. The floating rate on my mortgage is usually linked to some benchmark rate, which should ideally vary in consonance with the changing macroeconomic and financial conditions and from the central bank's perspective, if the monetary policy is to be effective, this benchmark rate should also move in consonance with the policy rate or the dial that I was describing earlier. Typically, banks will also charge the spread over the benchmark rate to factor in term premium and credit risk. You know, so my mortgage is not overnight, it's actually over a 10, 15, or 20 year period. Lots of interest rate changes will take place. Maybe I am a decent credit now, but I am going downhill. Uh, and you know, that is something that the banks would have to charge a premium for because they would have to take possession of the property property liquidated in case I can't pay my mortgage off. So there will be a spread on top of the benchmark rate uh, and that together the benchmark plus that spread is what will be my lending rate and this will keep getting reset periodically typically right now at an annual frequency. Um, the benchmark, which is what's going to ideally be fluctuating with the central bank's policy rate, could be of two types. It could be internal or external. An internal benchmark will be based on elements which are in part under the control of the bank that's giving me the mortgage. Uh, what are the factors that might drive it? It's the bank's cost of funds because it will like to recover its cost of funds on the loans that it makes. All the four systems that I mentioned to you are functioning right now as though they are in 
internal benchmark systems. In contrast, an external benchmark is a rate that is outside the control of the bank that's making the mortgage to me. For example, it could be determined in the market, such as a certificate of deposit rate on average across banks. It could be a treasury bill rate, say the 90-day borrowing cost of the government of India. It could be an interbank offer rate, the rate at which banks are lending to each other overnight or at some other maturity. Or simply, it could just be the central bank's policy rate. All of these rates are outside of the control of one individual bank out there. They are sort of market determined rates. Now, the, this is an important uh, distinction. The virtue of an external benchmark rate is that it is transparent. Uh, you know, everyone will be able to find exactly the same rate as to what is the Reserve Bank of India's policy rate right now, or what is the three month T bill rate in the market right now. So it's transparent, it is common across banks, and therefore borrowers can compare various loan offers by simply comparing the spreads that they are being charged over the benchmark provided all else is equal. So if I am shopping around for mortgages and if all mortgages are tied to the central bank uh, central bank's policy rate and then one bank is giving me a 1% extra mortgage rate on top of that and another bank is giving me 1.5% over the central bank's policy rate they are both for 20 years of maturity, there are no other strings attached, then I know that the first mortgage is cheaper than the other mortgage by 0.5 percentage points. So unless I really have a good reason to prefer the other bank because I think the relationship manager will give me good service when I go to the bank branch, etc. I would go to the cheaper mortgage. So I can compare if benchmarks are transparent, common across banks, I just have to compare spreads and it makes it easy for borrowers to shop around for the best products that they have. And what's important about this is that this can facilitate competition in the lending, which will then bring the rates down when we are trying to stimulate the economy with the policy rate cut. Now, as market rates normally move in line with the central bank's policy rate, an external benchmark is globally 
considered and adopted as more appropriate than an internal benchmark that is set individually by each bank for transmitting the monetary policy signals. Uh, in India, the Reserve Bank has provided banks flexibility to use both internal and external benchmarks, but the banks have preferred internal benchmarks so far over external benchmarks on two key grounds. First, that internal benchmark reflects the cost of funds, where there is some other market rates may not exactly reflect their cost of funds. I am going to spend quite a bit of time on this point. And second, it has been perceived that there have not been until recently any robust and vibrant external market benchmarks. Okay. Um, I'll come back to this point as well. Okay, so now having described this benchmark interest rate setting process, let me walk you through the four internal benchmarks uh, that we have. Uh, bear with me, this is minutia that I also don't want to dig into on a day-to-day -day basis, but to give you a complete picture of how we have arrived at where we have arrived, I'm just going to walk you through the history of all this a little bit. Um, in October 94, when the Reserve Bank deregulated lending rates for credit limits over rupees 2 lakhs, so if a bank was making mortgages or loans uh, which had quantum over rupees 2 lakhs, banks were required to declare their prime lending rates or PLR. These were the interest rates charged by banks to their most credit worthy borrowers. So, prime lending rates, lending rates for your prime borrowers. Uh, of course, this would still take into account factors such as cost of funds and transactions, cost for servicing, uh, mortgages, loans, etc. The PLR or the prime lending rate was expected to act as a floor for loans that were above rupees 2 lakh. The experience with its working of this prime lending rate setting process, however, was not satisfactory mainly for two reasons. One, the prime lending rate and the spread that the banks charged over the prime lending rate seemed to vary quite widely and inexplicably across banks. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, the prime lending rates of banks were rigid and inflexible in relation to the overall direction of interest 
interest rates in the economy. Okay, and you can see here that I'm where I'm trying to gradually move to is to explain how parts of the monetary transmission machinery could start creaking with the internal benchmarks that I'm talking about because it gives banks certain discretion over setting of the benchmark rate process. So even though the central bank has cut the policy rate, the market rates have moved, the bank now has a discretionary choice whether it wants to move its rate or not. Now, because the rates set by different banks are all discretionary, it's not easy for a borrower to compare two, two banks' mortgages. Because when one bank says it's PLR plus 1% and another bank says it's my PLR plus 1%, the two PLRs are not exactly the same. And so I cannot compare these mortgages on an apple to apple basis. They are actually different products because their lending rates are being chosen by that bank and every year when these rates set, it's again going to be another discretionary choice that this bank is going to exercise at that point. Now, in view of these concerns, the Reserve Bank advised banks in April 2003 to announce benchmark prime lending rates, where it now tried to get a little more prescriptive, not let the entire rate be the discretion of the bank, but guide them as to what should be the factors that should go into the setting of the benchmark lending rates. So banks have to take into account their cost of funds, operational costs, whatever minimum margin they had to earn to save some buffers on their balance sheets, so keep some uh, savings on balance sheets to meet uh, the risks uh, and the losses that they might incur on loans, uh, and some other profit margins that might be important for the bank to grow. This new system, the benchmark prime lending rate or the BPLR system, over time was also found to fall short of its desired objective of enhancing transparency and serving as the reference rate for pricing of loan products. In fact, what used to happen is that a large part of the lending used to take place at interest rates below the benchmark prime lending rates. Okay, and basically it created a lot of confusion and obfuscation as to what exactly is the benchmark rate at which loans are being made in the economy. 
in fact the share of loans that were taking place below the bplr was as high as 77% in september 2008 rendering it difficult for the central bank to assess the transmission of policy rate changes to lending rates of banks and you can imagine that if it was hard for us to understand the transmission how hard it must be for borrowers to actually compare different loan offers that they were getting in the market the residential housing loans and the consumer durable loans were at that point outside the purview of the bplr but as such all this sub bplr lending became a major distortion because you could cross subsidize one set of loans so for example if you had to evergreen your corporate loans you would need to lend to your corporate loans at very low rates then you would keep them sub bplr but charge everyone else at the reference rate or the benchmark rate so you would go and make a mortgage at the benchmark rate but keep a lot of loans under the reference rate because you had to just roll them over uh, at that point um, then the drawbacks of this bplr system led to the introduction of a new system called the base rate system in july 2010 the base rate was also based among other things on the cost of borrowed funds now there was in fact an indicative formula for arriving at the base rate uh, that was provided to banks by the reserve bank again the base rate was to be the minimum rate for all loans uh, except for some uh, special categories uh, with the actual lending rate charged to the borrowers being the base rate plus borrower specific charge or, or spread as i described my credit quality could change over time and there would be some credit premium on the loan uh, in practice the flexibility accorded to banks in the determination of cost of funds now whether it's your average cost of funds you might have taken some deposits 3 years back some 2 years back and some you are rolling over now in, in the market so it, is it the average cost of all the deposits that you have on your balance sheet is it just the marginal cost is it the cost of raising new funding from deposits in the market or is it some blended cost of new rates and past rates uh, this discussion as to how the cost of funds is 
is calculated. This now introduced opacity in the determination of lending rates by the banks and once again clouded an accurate assessment of the speed and strength of the transmission. Further, uh, of course, banks are adjusting the spreads over the base rate, but now you cannot look at the spreads in isolation because the benchmark rate itself is under the discretion of the banks. And so the whole analysis of how the transmission is working became extremely complex to analyze. Uh, and invariably the consequence of this has been that when policy rates have been cut by the Reserve Bank, they are not getting passed on to the borrowers at the pace and the nimbleness that we would like the transmission to work. Uh, the weakness and the rigidity is observed with transmission under the base rate system then led to the present system which is called as the MCLR system uh, starting April 1st, 2016. Uh, now, it was felt that the base rate, because it's some average rate, it moves very slowly. So, suppose the Reserve Bank of India has cut interest rates by 50 basis points over last two quarters, that hasn't necessarily changed the rate on my deposits that were taken three years back or two years back if they were fixed term deposits. So if I have to change my benchmark rate based on the average rate of my funding, even though the interest rates have been cut by 50 basis points, the central bank will not change the base rate that uh, the, the banks in the economy will not change the base rate that quickly because it's only the new deposits that will reflect uh, the, uh, the lowered cost of funding in the economy. So now the banks under the MCLR system were asked to take into account the marginal cost of funds. This, that's the new financing uh, that the bank is raising. Uh, unlike the base rate system, where as I said, uh, they could choose between the average cost or the marginal cost or a blended version of that cost. Under MCLR, banks were required to do this based on the marginal cost of finance. Now, again, progressively as we moved from the PLR to BPLR to base rate to MCLR, the hope was that now that we made it based on the marginal finance, 
the lending rates in the economy will become more sensitive to changes in the policy rate visa uh, vis all its predecessors uh, of course again the actual lending rate will be the mclr of the bank plus a spread which uh, again will reflect some credit risk premium uh, the base rate system was allowed to be in operation uh, at the same time that the mclr system was introduced to contract new loans uh, because it was felt that these contracts on base rates will mature at some point and then will just be left with the mclr system now all of these rates have this one property that they are internal benchmarks they are left to the discretion of being said by each bank rather than being set by a market or rather than being set by the central bank itself like its policy rate and the expected benefits of the mclr system Uh, better transparency more flexibility and, and most importantly faster transmission from policy rate to the real economy however have continued to elude as documented in reserve bank's recent study called report of the internal study group to review the working of the marginal cost of funds based lending rate system uh, chaired by dr janak raj from our monetary policy department uh, the analysis uh, in this report indicate that the transmission of uh, it has four critical results that the transmission has been slow and incomplete under both the base rate and the mclr system uh, so let me just show that uh, so this is a table that summarizes this transmission i'll just try and explain this uh, focus on the first column that the central bank's policy rate or the repo rate and it's over different periods so take the first two periods uh, october 2017 uh, over end december 2014 so what has been the cumulative change in the central bank's policy rate over that period it's been two percentage points or 200 basis points from october 17 over just april 2016 why am i choosing april 2016 because that's the date when the latest mclr rate setting system was introduced over that period the repo rate or the policy 
this rate was changed by 75 basis points. Now you, you can see that over this period the deposit, the term deposit rates of banks I have given two measures over there. They have sort of reflected the policy rate. So as the policy rate changed by 200 basis points, the median deposit rate of banks changed by 166 basis points. So for a 2 percentage point policy rate cut, banks deposit rates changed by 1.66 percent. And in fact, if instead of taking median, if I weigh the size of the deposits while weighing the overall deposit rate of the bank, in fact, the pass through is almost one for one. The deposit rates weighted by the sizes of deposits came down by exactly 200, 199 basis points. So that's a pretty good pass through that we would want in the economy. So that's one leg that's working well. Now, why do we want the deposit rates to come down? We want the deposit rates to come down so that a bank says, okay, I have lower cost of funds. Let me go and outbid someone else in the market for lending. Because then I'll get a new loan volume coming to me. How do I do that? I have lower cost of funds. I can go and lower my lending rates. And then if the lending rates come down, that virtuous cycle of growth, etc., uh, takes hold. But if you go to the right, you see that the lending rates don't actually reflect as strongly uh, this pass-through. Uh, the median base rate, in fact, changed only by 75 basis points. So 50% of the bank portfolio, which was the legacy portfolio tied to the base rate as the benchmark lending rate, when those rates are reset, even though banks' deposit rates have come down by as much as 200 basis points, the rate that is getting passed on to the outstanding loans is actually only 75 basis points. Okay. Uh, on the fresh uh, rupee loans, which are the new loans that are taking place, there is better outcomes, there is more competition over there and you can see that the pass through there in the rightmost column is 1.92 percentage points. So there the transmission is working well. So it seems that banks do well in competing for the new loans. However, if I have an existing mortgage, no one is knocking on my doors and telling me, do you want to refinance this mortgage because I can actually offer you a cheaper mortgage, my cost of funds has in fact gone down. Uh, 
and we observe the pass through as being not that perfect even over april 1st 2016 which is the mclr system you can see that the base rate over that 18 month period or uh, slightly over uh, 12 month period as the pass through is only 15 basis points for a 75 basis point rate cut so we are cutting interest rates by 0.75 percent but only one fifth of it is getting reflected into the outstanding legacy loans of banks uh, uh, so to summarize the pass through is slow it's incomplete it's significant on fresh loans but muted for outstanding loans and that's true both under the base rate system as well as the uh, mclr system uh, i'm not showing this here but we find that the pass through is actually uneven across uh, borrowing categories uh, and it's also asymmetric it doesn't work the same way when we are tightening versus when we are cutting rates uh, in fact as you can expect the transmission because it is left as the discretion to the banks has worked where when we tighten rates the pass through through lending rates is faster the loan rates increase at a faster pace when central bank raises rates but not as quickly in terms of the reduction uh, in the rates so what explains the slow and incomplete pass through from the policy rate changes to the lending rates i think it's critical to understand the economics of this to know what perhaps might have to be done uh, and two broad factors uh, emerge uh, as having dampened the transmission to the lending rates first as i said a sizable legacy loan portfolio of banks is still linked to the base rate uh, lending rates under the base rate system are relatively stickier than the loans that are linked to mclr because the base rate banks have chosen to set based on these average rates during the current easing cycle of monetary policy as against 200 basis points or 2 percentage points of cumulative cut in the repo rate the base rate has declined only by uh, 80 basis points or 0.8 percent Uh, since the introduction of the mclr in april 2016 as against the cumulative cut in repo rate
rate by uh, 75 basis points, the base rate has declined by just about uh, 20 basis points. And the study group that analyzes this uh, in our team at Reserve Bank, their analysis suggested that banks deviated in an ad hoc manner from the specified methodologies for calculating the base rate and the MCLR. So, in moving from the PLR to BPLR to base rate and MCLR, progressively the Reserve Bank got more prescriptive in the formula for setting the benchmark rates. But then, you know, the cost Funds, the operational costs, these are still left as discretionary choices of the banks. And we found that these choices were, were quite ad hoc, so that the banks had great flexibility to either inflate the base rate on the MCLR and prevent them from falling quickly in line with their cost of funds. Okay, and so what is the game that is going on in some sense is that your deposit rates come down, but if your lending rates don't come down at the same pace, and if no one is actually able to see through as to how much should my lending rates come down, you can keep earning the fat margin uh, as a bank. Uh, in fact, you can see this uh, visually as well, uh, which is that when our uh, policy repo rate is getting cut, which is the rate at the bottom, uh, you can see that one year median MCLR uh, is, move, is coming down, but not one for one. There is the red line, which is the base rate, is actually even slower in, in adjusting. Another way you can look at transmission is what is the slope of this line. So, if you plot on your y axis the MCLR rate or the base rate and on x axis the policy repo rate if this has a slope of 1 so the it's a 45 degree line then the pass through is 1 for 1 okay that would be the simplest way of knowing whether your monetary pass through is working well or not. You can see that this line is not like it's actually more like a slope of one fifth or one third or something like that. Um, Uh, so, the second reason, so the first reason is that there is ad hocness in the benchmark rate itself. Second, spreads that are charged by banks 
over the benchmark rates such as the base rate or MCLR, they are also adjusted to offset the changes in the benchmark rate. So, suppose that the benchmark rate is supposed to come down by 50 basis points or 75 basis points. So, I change my benchmark rate, but at the reset point on the mortgage, I now increase my spread by 75 basis points. Then actually there is no net transmission that took place to the borrower because whatever is happening on the benchmark rate, I am completely offsetting on the spread on the other side. Uh, now, of course, the spread over the benchmark rate could vary from bank to bank uh, due to variety of reasons, but the study group through careful analysis observed uh, that these spreads were also getting adjusted quite arbitrarily and the variation in spreads across banks for similar quality borrowers was too large to be explained purely on the basis of borrower's health or uh, risk of the borrower defaulting or the credit risk as they call it. So, these uh, spreads were expected to play only a small role in transmission. The big role was supposed to be played by the movement in the benchmark, but the spread was actually playing quite a big role uh, in the overall transmission process uh, as well. So, why does, why does this come about? Uh, why is it that the pass through is so muted? Why is this line flat rather than being a 45 degree uh, slope one line? So, one plausible underlying reason that is proposed by banks, and I think uh, it is reasonable, is the rigidity on the liability side of their banks, uh, which is that uh, in India about 90 percent of total liabilities of banks are in the form of deposits that you and I make with the banks. We deposit our savings hoping that we can withdraw them uh, when we want. Sometimes we put them into fixed term deposits to earn slightly higher rates. Uh, but as you must have observed through your banking transactions, bank deposit rates are predominantly at fixed interest rates. They are not actually floating rates. When you get a deposit rate, it's 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 given to you at some fixed rate, 5 percent, 7 percent, 8 percent. It's not something that's sold to you by saying, oh, this is going to fluctuate up and down with how the central bank is actually managing the policy rate in the economy. Now, of course, if these deposit rates therefore take time to adjust, 
just because only the new deposits will reflect the new uh, policy rates in the economy, there is going to be some rigidity in the transmission process. Uh, further, over 36 percent of these deposits of banks have maturities which are three years and above. So, here is a table that shows what is the maturity of deposit. So, if my deposits are very short term, then pretty much everything is getting renewed. So, in the extreme, think about all, suppose all of your deposits were just overnight maturity. Every night, the bank is actually setting a new interest rate on your deposit. That would be very good for monetary policy passed through because as the market rate changes, the, the banks will change and provide you a new rate on your deposit. But what you observe progressively as you go to the right, if you look at three years to five years, you can see that even now about 26% of the deposits are in three years and above maturity. On average, they have been actually uh, over 36 percent, implying that a part of the funding cost of banks is getting reset infrequently and with significant lags to the policy rate changes. So, the average cost of deposits of banks is coming down rather slowly and uh, that's not good for transmission uh, through, the, uh, through the bank balance sheet. Uh, what is also not recognized is that large uh, access that our banks have to low cost current and savings account funds. They are called as CASA in the banking parlance. These CASA funds constitute about 40 percent of aggregate bank deposits with the share of saving deposits at around 31%. Banks are free to decide saving deposit interest rates since October 2011. And the hope was that if you just set this free, then when the policy rates are cut, the deposit rates will come down quickly and vice versa. But until recently, most banks chose to leave the savings deposit rates unchanged. Uh, in fact, ignoring completely the monetary policy movement or impulses. Uh, major banks kept their saving deposit rates unchanged at 4% between October 2011 and July 2017. So, almost a six year period, even as the Reserve Bank's policy rate moved significantly over the 
this period from 8.5% in October 2011 to 7.25% in August 2013. It increased again to 8% by January 2014 before declining to 6% by August 2017, but this doesn't produce a parallel sort of a movement in the CASA deposit rates uh, of banks. Furthermore, and quite importantly, there has been a deterioration in banking sector health in the past several years due to worsening of asset quality uh, and the expected loan losses in credit portfolios. Uh, these have made uh, banks capacity to bear losses on fresh loans quite low so that they are now keen to earn very high margins on the new loans that are coming out there. In effect, there is a cross subsidization from the margins that are earned on new loans against the losses that are going to happen on the legacy bad loans uh, that these banks have and these stressed assets are presently quite large. So to maintain their profitability in the wake of these large losses that are coming due on a big part of the public sector banking system, uh, banks are wanting to keep lending rates quite high relative to the deposit rates. As a result, also the transmission to lending rates has been severely impacted. Um, and finally, the competition that banks face from alternative instruments of financial savings such as mutual funds and small savings schemes, they also seem to have made banks hesitant in varying the interest rates on term deposits. Uh, in consonance with policy rate signals. So, bank deposits do have some advantages in the form of stable returns compared to mutual fund schemes where there might be investments in market securities like equities or bonds whose prices are fluctuating in the market on a day-to-day -day basis. They might not be as liquid as a bank deposit. Um, you might not be able to withdraw it intraday if you want. Uh, you might have to wait till end of day liquidations. Uh, but bank deposits can be in a disadvantageous position if there are tax uh, advantages in comparison to this scheme. So, you know, if you don't withdraw from your mutual fund scheme for longer than a year, if you don't have to pay, then for the same return, you would rather take a mutual fund scheme than a deposit because of the 
differential tax uh, advantage. So all of these factors have imparted rigidity to the liability side of banks' balance sheets with respect to policy rate changes. Uh, so, uh, so that's a sort of uh, uh, so I've done two parts so far. Uh, I know it's taking long, but I'm I'm getting to the end. Uh, I've spoken about what monetary transmission is and how it is supposed to work. And then I have explained that it is not working as smoothly as one would like uh, in India, in spite of these attempts to change the internal benchmarks and making them less discretionary, more prescriptive, but still with some discretion on the inputs that the banks are putting into all this. And as I explained, it is also in a time when perhaps, especially over the last few years, the health of public sector banks has been uh, not as great as one might have liked. So how do we improve transmission? What is the way forward? So drawing from its comprehensive analysis, the RBI study group has suggested a number of steps to end enhance transparency and transmission from monetary policy signals to the actual lending rates. The recommendations pertain to improving transmission based on the existing lending rate system as well as proposing a fundamental Fundamental reform of the interest rate setting process. So let me touch upon the four major recommendations of the study group. Uh, essentially, the study group concludes that because of the less than desired performance of internal benchmark lending rate systems, uh, there is a need to shift to an external benchmark based lending rate system. Uh, the internal regimes are not in sync with global practices on pricing of bank loans or mortgages. And given the scope of arbitrariness under all of these internal systems, internal benchmark system, the study group has recommended that the switch over to an external benchmark needs to be pursued in a time bound manner. While recognizing that no external benchmark in India meets all the requirements of an ideal benchmark, and after analyzing the pros and cons of 13 possible market determined candidates, the study group has recommended three, the treasury bill rate, this is the rate at which the government of India borrows in the short term to meet
meet its own uh, cash flow needs or liquidity needs. Uh, the certificate of deposit rate, these are the rates that you can aggregate across the highest credit banks in the economy at, uh, at some short maturities, say 3 months, 6 months, 12 months. Uh, and the third is the Reserve Bank of India's policy repo rate, the dial that I was mentioning that we change. Uh, according to the study group, these three benchmark rates are better suited than other interest rates to serve the role of an external benchmark. Uh, the group has recommended that all floating rate loans be that are extended beginning April 1st, 2018 could be referenced to one of these three external benchmarks which the Reserve Bank might select based on the feedback that we are receiving and evaluating from various stakeholders on this proposal. Second, the study group has recommended that the decision on the spread over the external benchmark be left entirely to the commercial judgment of banks. However, this spread remained fixed through the term of the loan. Okay, so what's going to be what in what is being proposed, what will float is what is linked to the market rate and that in turn would move as I was explaining with the policy rate changes that the central bank brings about. Banks can price in whatever they want about credit risk, maturity risk, etc. and give you a spread, but then that spread on top of the benchmark under the study group's proposal will remain fixed during the term. So when a borrower goes and takes a mortgage or a loan from a bank, they know that the only component that is going to fluctuate over time now is actually going to be the uh, the pure interest rate or the external benchmark component. Now, of course, if there is a credit event, which is that, you know, the borrower's condition deteriorates in a very material way, then the contract, the borrower and the lender could agree that in that case we will reset even the spread uh, on this loan. Third recommendation is that the periodicity of resetting the interest rates by banks on all floating rate loans, retail as well as corporate so mortgages as well as corporate loans and other personal loans, it be reduced from once a year to once in a quarter. So that if policy rates are cut 
actually the reset points are going to happen not with a lag of four quarters but at most with a lag of one quarter after the policy rate has been cut so this would expedite the pass through from the monetary policy signal to the actual lending rates and fourth to reduce the rigidity on the deposit side banks be encouraged to accept deposits especially bulk deposits the large volume deposits at floating rates that are also linked to the selected external benchmark okay because then bulk of your deposits which are say your wholesale liability is not the not the deposit that comes from me but say your deposit that comes from a large corporate savings that would also change with the central bank's policy rate so the cost of funds will come down quickly and the lending rate is also going to come down quickly the spread will remain fixed and so what's primarily happening then through transmission is that all rates in the economy will come down one for one uh, and this stimulus that we are hoping will will actually go through more seamlessly Uh, the common theme underlying all these recommendations is the effort to improve the monetary policy transmission so that the changes transmit quickly and adequately to banks lending rates and importantly in a transparent manner if two banks come to you with a mortgage you should be able to tell fairly quickly which is the cheaper product out of these two right now that's not so easy to do um, and we also want to make the liability side more flexible to address the bank's concern that oh my deposit cost is rather rigid that doesn't move with your policy rate so why should i cut my lending rates uh, so even that would get addressed if at least the bulk deposits are also switched to the floating rate benchmark Uh, the report has been uh, put up in public domain on October 4th 2017 uh, if you took immense liking to what i had to say today then uh, please go and uh, look up the report you will see a lot of details there uh, we have been receiving feedback from all stakeholders not just banks but also general public and media uh, we'll be evaluating this feedback and suggestions quite carefully and take a considered view factoring in transition costs of moving from a base rate and mclr to an external benchmark and provide some 
calibrated path over a period of time to the desired benchmarking system. Before I close, I have to touch upon the issue that I mentioned about shoring up of bank balance sheets or the credit channel uh, of monetary transmission. Um, one reason why, uh, why we demand for bank credit could be one of the factors leading to the observed slowdown in credit growth over the past four or five years. A primary cause for the slowdown has been found in a research to also be the weak balance sheets, especially of public sector banks, in view of the large non-performing assets. Uh, they seem to have made banks quite risk averse. Uh, and induced in them uh, and induced in the economy a reduction in, in the supply of credit. In fact, what's interesting is that undercapitalized banks essentially have capital to survive but not necessarily to grow. factor which is that even if the central bank cuts policy rates, market rates might change but banks are not in a position to compete in the market for loans because they have no buffers for taking for the losses. and then they 
they can start lending to the healthier parts of the economy again. So these initiatives, the the insolvency and bankruptcy code and the ordinance and then the act allowing the Reserve Bank to direct cases or reference cases to the bankruptcy code. These are now being supported by the government's decision to recapitalize public sector banks. Uh, in a front loaded manner, so there will be some initial capital injections with a total allocation of rupees 2.1 trillion, uh, comprising some budgetary provisions up to rupees 181 billion. Uh, some recapitalization bonds that the government will issue uh, on the balance sheets of these banks up to rupees 1.35 trillion and there will also be raising of capital in the market by banks uh, in the form of uh, equity fundraising. Essentially, the public sector banks will be diluting government equity share up to 52%. And this is this fundraising is expected to be around rupees 580 billion. These two steps together, asset resolution and bank recapitalization are expected to strengthen bank balance sheets significantly and improve their ability and willingness to uh, lend at rates that are more consistent with the policy rates. This would result also in better monetary transmission, potentially creating the virtuous cycle of growth and stability that I was talking about. So there are essentially two reforms that are being proposed, as I said. One is still in works, which is to change the process of benchmarking, uh, spread setting, the reset frequency, and making the deposits of banks fluctuate with the policy rates, and then fixing the conditions of the banks so that if there is capacity in the economy to grow, they have the ability and the willingness to actually compete there. So, uh, let me conclude. Uh, in my view, there is uh, a deeper economic question at hand in all these recommendations, especially in the recommendation in moving towards an external benchmark. Uh, and the issue is the following. I just want to leave it with you as a thought question, which is if interest rates in the economy have to be moved to steer the economy to stable growth, etc. Who should bear the interest rate risk? Uh, 
that gets created in the end? Should it be the borrower? Uh, should it be the saver or the depositor in the economy? Uh, like some of us, or should it be the banks? Uh, who is likely to be better at managing and distributing this interest rate risk uh, in rest of the economy? Uh, retail depositors and borrowers like you and me are unlikely to have efficient tools in my opinion to manage the fluctuations in the interest rate risk. We'll just have to absorb them into our lifestyles uh, in one way or the other. Cut back on spending if the cost of mortgage becomes too high relative to the inflation in our wages, for example. Uh, banks, however, should ideally have the wherewithal to manage the interest rate risk. They should have the sophistication to figure out where to lay off this risk that's coming on their balance sheet. Uh, similarly, bulk depositors and large corporate borrowers can also be expected to be in a position to manage this interest rate risk. Many of the large corporations have their own treasury that should actually try to shop around and figure out how to uh, pass around this interest rate risk elsewhere. Non-bank financial institutions with less exposure to interest rate risk than banks, such as insurance and pension funds, they have savings that are going to stay with them for a very long period of time. They could also be good repositories of this risk. So banks can create this risk, but then we could find ways of repackaging these risks to those who actually have savings for a much longer horizon than deposits uh, that are out there. Foreign banks could come into the ecosystem to offset the interest rate risks of our economy globally because the interest rate cycle in other economies may not be happening in exactly the same sync uh, as our interest rate cycle is moving. A combination of such interest rate risk transfer mechanisms through market products uh, such as interest rate derivatives, uh, which are now prevalent in most uh, large economies, uh, and then what are called the securitized products, where banks take a large pool of loans or mortgages and repackage certain risks such as interest rate risk of that portfolio needs to ensure other investors, these would have to in parallel emerge in our economy uh, so that banks 
banks also don't necessarily have to bear these risks. Uh, they don't have to have, have rigid uh, balance sheet structures. Hopefully, I'll focus sometime soon on these issues in a companion piece. I guess it would be titled Monetary Transmission in India. How can it be improved? So let me stop there. Uh, I think if there is time, I can take a couple of questions, but I don't know if you guys are really hungry or So I know your uh, context and background in reply. Hello. Uh, good evening, Dr. Acharya. Um, I'm an economist from background. My background is of economics. Uh, my question to you is that uh, in the last 12 months, our economy has faced two shocks, demonetization, which squeezed the demand, and the GST rollout, which squeezed supply. As a result of which, uh, <coughs> we have lagged our Asian peers in terms of of our uh, exports growth. So if you look at the exports growth of our Asian countries, uh, they have been uh, growing at a faster pace than what Indian economy, Indian export is. Uh, if you look at the previous GDP print, uh, which was 5.7% uh, the government is uh, uh, spending which supported it was to the tune of 140 basis point uh, stripping that off the GDP growth was 0.3% and the drag due to higher imports was uh, 280 basis point. So, uh, do you think that moving on, the even though the growth picks up, uh, we may find that the government no longer has the means to support this. Supported because uh, there has been a a uh, big chunk of uh, government spending low, uh, front loading in the first half of the fiscal year. So, uh, given that uh, <coughs> narrative and that uh, the inflation is uh, expected to rise here on as per your NPC reports, uh, do you think there is the scope for uh, or the need for further uh, easing in the policy rates? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I can see that just as I have given a long speech, you've also given a long question. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it would not be right for me to speculate on the monetary policy 
policy committees uh, decisions uh, going forward uh, but i think what i would say in the context of the talk that i gave today is that uh, we believe that there is further scope for transmission of monetary policy accommodation or policy rate cuts that have already taken place we think that there is actually scope for further transmission uh, and in some sense the objective of uh, of the rbi study and the uh, reforms that i proposed have been to try and see if we can deliver on what we have already done uh, through our policy change but get it to the end uh, users uh, in the real economy uh, but i would stress one thing which is that, that you know some of these reforms are of course quite structural they will take a while to play out especially the gst uh, i would not underestimate the importance of the insolvency and bankruptcy code i think being able to take a bankrupt a company and resolve it within 270 days is actually if we can deliver on this we would actually have a faster bankruptcy code than many many developed countries in the world i think this could uh, stimulate the market for corporate bonds in our economy uh, it would reduce the reliance on banks uh, for financing especially from large corporations for infrastructure investments etc uh, and third i think the recapitalization of banks that's been announced i think the plan is to also reform uh, the public sector banks uh, at the same time uh, and we are hoping that the confluence of many of the structural factors along with a better monetary transmission can actually deliver well on what has already been uh, pushed through um, i would just mention one thing which is that uh, as i said right at the beginning in the in the technical jargon piece the central bank monetary policies mandate is to achieve over medium term the target inflation rate of 4% uh, and you know the recent inflation trends have been uh, in that zone uh, there is some uh, mounting pressure through oil prices uh, in the economy as well and so these are all factors that the monetary policy has to take into account while at the same time as our mandate says uh, keeping in mind the objective of growth so you know that's uh, 
difficult trade off it's a little hard for me to resolve it myself uh, and also uh, before the monetary policy meeting takes place so you have to wait for 2:30 pm on the one of the wednesdays days in first weekend of the wednesdays first wednesday of december i think so so uh, just one more question i think let's give someone else a chance and then if there's time we can rotate yeah.
prices, etc., will make it advantageous for these firms to invest more. So then, uh, you know, in a quarter's time, when this savings reallocate, the companies will see that their prices are going up. This is a good time to raise equity in the market. Or they will see that insurance companies are willing to buy their 10-year or 15-year bonds at much lower interest rates than before because they are getting flooded with people interested in policies uh, with them and they have to deploy these premiums that they are collecting to use. So these companies will say, let's go and float some bonds in the market. Maybe they will go and approach banks which on the one hand are experiencing deposit outflows, but on the other hand, whatever deposits are staying with them, their cost is also very low, so they can afford to actually even bring down loan rates to bring some of the uh, lending back to them. So now once these, if this happens, then the firms will start investing. Now as they start investing, they will need to hire labor, they may have to import more oil, they may have to buy more raw materials. Unless all of that supply of all of that adjusts instantaneously, the price of labor will go up, the price of oil will go up. That just now a demand effect, assuming that the supply is not fully offsetting it. Uh, and that, so on the one hand, economic activity will pick up, but as they sometimes say, the economy will also get heated. Uh, you know, the prices will start rising because as the price rises, I know that there is lot of uh, jobs available, lot of people are posting advertisements, my wage expectations will rise. So if I have to move to another firm, I will say, yes, I'll do so, but you know, you need to give me a 10% uh, pay rise over the next year only then. I will come in. So I, I, I think you are absolutely right that a lot has to work for that dial from one office in the central bank to actually then act as a lever that is going to pull up the entire economy. And I think your question is exactly the right. One has to be really sure that the initial conditions of your banking system, the way they are setting interest rates on deposits, the way they are setting interest rates on loans, the, your markets, the way the health of your companies, the ability of your banks to lend and take some risks, that all of these are in structurally in place 
so that the dial can actually be a powerful tool. If not, as I was saying, things may, may get wasted. You may get some pass through here, but nothing is happening there. You know, so if, if deposit rates get reduced, but there is no reduction in loan rates, then the savers didn't get the benefit. The borrowers didn't get the benefit. It's the intermediary who pocketed a margin in between. Maybe they are doing it because they are trying to fix their balance sheet because of past losses. But it's important to understand what these frictions are because if you understand the frictions, you can identify what are the right remedies uh, but I, I i would encourage everyone to ask exactly the question that you pose which is basically question fundamentally why would what i am doing in the central bank or what other central banks are doing would actually reach any one of us in the first place. Yes. Uh, last question. So, good afternoon. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Saurabh I'm an investment advisor. I just want to ask you that you said that the banks have given the option to use either an internal or an external benchmark for deciding the mortgage loan. So one is that I understand that there are few banks who are following both the benchmarks simultaneously for some customers they are using an internal benchmark and for some customers they are using an external benchmark so if a customer is offered an external benchmark can it shift back to the internal benchmark later on that's one question and second is why is it what are the challenges that RBI is facing it to make it more mandatory to pay, uh, use an external benchmark? And because I, I believe that that would be a popular uh, system as well, also because as you rightly said, it's more transparent. Right, right. So I think you know, uh, you know, the first point is right, which is uh, what happens is, and this was coming back to the last part of the concluding sentences I said, which is that some borrowers will have better ability to manage interest rate risk fluctuations than others, or homeowner will not be able to do that as well as the large uh, industrial uh, house in the economy because they will have a treasury operation and they will try to manage the interest rate risk as it fluctuates on their loan in some way. So, uh, it could be that the banks are essentially just catering to the sophistication of their borrower through the benchmark. Uh, what would it take for us to move to an external benchmark? I think first we have to carefully evaluate all the 
feedback that we are having. Uh, as well, I was just responding in the uh, first question. There is some important uh, shocks that the economy is actually coming out of several structural reforms that are taking place. Uh, we want to ensure that the rollout of the external benchmark setting process uh, is at a time when again some additional frictions in implementing something new can be absorbed well by the system. We don't want to necessarily add one more uh, uncertainty or noise uh, in the mix at this point. So I think we have to carefully think about the right transition path to where we want to be. Uh, the study group suggestions are, of course, very clear, as I, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, okay. okay. So, uh, thank you very much for being a patient, and at least for those of you who managed to sit through for also being a persistent audience. Thank you very much. Let's thank, thank you. you. And uh, please join us for tea outside the auditorium.